Hey everybody, I am Kenneth Moten. We're gonna talk about the power of social media and the lives of young people, Generation Z. There's definitely a lot of phone usage at my school. You'll go to lunch and you'll see kids just sitting on their phone and they won't communicate. And I think a lot of people have lost um, their ability to communicate because of the phones and social media. When I was younger, my mom like didn't allow me to have social media. And I can say like back then, I had like way better mental health, my uh, self-esteem was better. The difference now with having it, like yes, it does, you know, foster connection and community, but people do anything to stand out and that includes lying and, you know, doing clickbait. I think at a certain level, social media can be a really great way to be authentic. Um, but I do think when you rise to a certain level of popularity and have that much attention on you, I think that's when a lot of people tend to curate their content more so to appeal to what their fans want and also the image that they wish to convey. And I think it's very easy, very quickly to get away from the authentic content that you started with. I definitely do start to question things I see because it's very easy to edit and like skew the way people will view content. and. I, I don't trust social media all the way. Everything can be staged because it's just a camera and you can control it. We want to ask the children like, what do they want to be when they grow up? They want to be a YouTuber. And nowadays, the young people want to be like influencers. Like it's a way to live. And it's a way to contact with everybody and I can't win money. This has provided pathways for black voices to be heard and to speak out against injustice. That's the promising aspect of social media in the African-American community, as well as those who are coming from third world countries, the ability to level the playing field and have their narratives shared and their experiences shared. We think of social media as there being a space for everyone. For black and brown content creators, is it fair? Is it a fair space to play in? Short answer is no. There are black and brown folks who have you know, 500,000 followers to a million followers, they're unable to find the monetization pathways to make this actually be sustainable. They're still living at home with their parents. What is the price of visibility? Surveillance is something that comes with visibility. No, it's not necessarily a level playing field. People really do use social media, but back home in Ethiopia, uh, they usually use Facebook to get news. We've seen Facebook used by users to create polarization when it comes to political issues. So despite its you know, importance in you know, providing um, news and information to users, it has also been used as a weapon to create two sides within the political sphere, and it had major consequences. I think for someone that has critical thinking can pinpoint some important aspects that exist in the society. If you are young, you cannot put your critical skills on play. It can be a danger. We create a public opinion that can be used as an instrument. You want to influence the elections. What surprised you when you started posting? Um, I was very surprised after seeing the unexpected response that I got from the public. My first video when I was just six years old back in 2018, January, I created my first video about a topic which I was not actually familiar with. I've learned that if you want to do something, if you want to bring a change in the society, you should start from yourself because you are the one who is actually going to bring a change in the society. Good afternoon, everyone. As the, our Master of Ceremony said, my name is Guilherme Canella. I'm the head of the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists section here. What you just watched was a pre-conference event that was organized uh, by our chair at the University of South Carolina a few days ago. Uh, it was uh, almost an entire day listening to young people including very young people like this last uh, girl that appeared in the video. And this is because from the very beginning of this process, we were alerted by some of the organizations and groups commenting the work UNESCO, uh, the most stakeholder work UNESCO uh, is in the process of developing, that we need to find a ways to engage the voices, the comments, the concerns of Yes, the young population, as well as the teenagers, and also the rights uh, related to children. 
Uh, and we thought that having this half an hour that we are going to have here was not enough to do that. So the University of South Carolina was uh, open enough to organize a very entire day pre-conference. You just had a uh, snapshot of what happened there. Uh, we are very grateful for them for that, but of course they, they sent to us all the conclusions of that pre-conference with young people, and this is also part uh, of the materials we are going to use to keep improving uh, these guidelines. But you heard in the first day uh, the Brazilian influencer Felipe Neto explaining how important it is to take into consideration the specific, the specific comments and needs uh, of young population and teenagers, etc. You just heard in the last session before this on the user empowerment and the media and information literacy elements, how this is also very much connected to the young population. So we thought it was also very important to bring this discussion here to the main conference. I have two fantastic uh, young uh, colleagues here with me, Charlotte Ernest, young entrepreneur from Austria, and Ashan Edalaktika, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. He's uh, currently living in Austria as well, but uh, you're a student from Iran, right? Originally from Iran. Uh, and their participation is possible also the, thanks to the partnership we have for this session and the side event that's going to take place tomorrow with the World Summit Award. So we will keep discussing young participation tomorrow in a side event after the conference. So we had something pre-conference and we have something post-conference as well and in conference just to show how UNESCO is very much concerned and interested in hearing voices from young people. But to not only have the video from what happened in South Carolina, we have online uh, with us very early in the US and in, in, uh, crossing the Atlantic, V. Uh, Spihar, and he is uh, the under, under the desk news host. So V, thank you so much also for joining us. Uh, I hope you had already had breakfast uh, <laughs> and uh, this will be very interesting. So look, um, uh, we, you also saw in the program that we had the, we should have the participation of Ambassador and Hiverdier in this session. Uh, he had unfortunately a last minute problem, so he's not going to join us. So we will have this conversation with Charlotte, Ashham and V for uh, the next minute. So let me ask you, the three of you uh, the same question. You heard during uh, these days, and V, you also heard that because you participated in South Carolina, these key concerns uh, regarding uh, hate speech online, disinformation online, conspiracy theories online, and we can keep giving examples of problems. But we also uh, were discussing the fantastic opportunities that the internet offered to all of us, but particularly to children and, the, and youth. Uh, I don't know many of you know, before I joined UNESCO, I was working with children, uh, children's freedom of expression. And uh, this is one, still one of our key challenges, how to make sure that the right of children to free express themselves is guaranteed as is established in Article 12 and 13 of the Child's Convention. Uh, and the internet actually offered this opportunity uh, that this group that uh, until the internet only had freedom of expression mediated by the adult world, they could actually express themselves. And of course, this is fantastic for freedom of expression. But at the same time, how we create uh, enough resilience uh, to deal with the concrete risks that are out there is another important part of that. So what is your take here when we are discussing these issues, uh, how you find yourselves, uh, your concerns, your <laughs> ideas, and how are you interacting with your peers on that? Who, who wants to start? You? Um, is this um, on? Yeah. I'll take the start on it if that's fine. Um, okay, sure. I'm Charlotte. I'm really thankful to be offered this stage to share my views and my opinion. Um, but there's one thing I really want to put a lot of pressure on and ask everyone in this room, and that's why are only three young people taking part in this discussion? There's so much you want to know from us and learn from us, but we're, we're only three people. Like, how, how do you want to solve the problem by in including three young people in this discussion? There's nothing's going to happen. Um, 
we're the ones who grow up with social media, we're the ones who shape the trends, we're the, one who the ones who define how, social, how digital platforms are gonna happen in the future, but you cannot solve the issue without including us. Um, getting into fights, um, hate speech, harm on social media, getting into fights is a natural part of life. Back in the days it was hands-on fights, now it's on digital platforms. That's just um, a part of growing up on digital platforms and it's something very natural. Um, we all get into fights, we all get hate messages, we've all um, experienced harmful content. Especially as a woman, you have to deal with a lot of harmful content and hate speech concerning harassment on digital platforms. I believe every woman, especially my age, um, has experienced cyber catcalling. And a big issue that I've learned from observing uh, reactions to cyber catcalling is that it's getting port portrayed and dealt as something that so something that people are laughing at. No, nobody really takes it serious. Um, it happens so often that it, that it becomes something so normal, but it's still harassment and people need to be reminded of that. Um, if people laugh about hate speech and disinformation and don't take the, seri the issue seriously, no new regulations or policies are gonna solve the issue. And that's the point where we come back to not having enough education on the topic. There's, I believe there's a very thin line between having an opinion and um, and sharing hate and disinformation. And that line needs to be defined and taught to young users, users so they can distinguish between finding certain comments funny or concerning. Um, the question that needs to be asked is how do we break that fundamental mindset that harassment and hate speech is something funny because it's just a meme, it's supposed to be funny, or um, it's just online and, and it can't actually hurt anybody. That's that's. Those are things that we actually hear. Those are things why we don't take the issue seriously. We're not educated enough on the topic. Um, and it's very easy to hide behind a username, but people would never actually um, tell you those things face to face. No one would ever dare. Um, harmful content and hate speech not being regulated shapes our mind into thinking it's normal and really nothing that bad. And once we start seeing more and more hate speech and harmful information, our mind gets trigger triggered into normalizing it, which then impacts our behavior outside of the digital world as well. That's why our generation is so extremely violent because we start believing it's okay and it's funny to hurt people and we start doing it in real life and then again share videos and information or hate speech online because we think, oh, it's just so funny. Um, we get really manipulated into finding it entertaining, so the regulation of content shapes our definition of harm, hate speech, and misinformation. Thank you so much. That's a very powerful statement on, on these issues. Ashun, let me ask you, you were commenting with me before we started that you have a very concrete experience uh, on these issues on your own context. Could you share a little bit of us of these elements? Of course, yeah. So the most important value <coughs> Excuse me. It's, it's trust. Internet is more than just a virtual platform. It's more than just an algorithm. It shapes the mindset of the youth in real time. It uh, harms the most vulnerable people, the children, the youth. And let me tell you a story. So. About uh, two years ago, I decided to visit my former build school to see how my former teacher is doing. And I saw a huge gap between the generations, the students and the teachers. The teachers saw cyberbullying within the school community because it was a very diverse uh, school, 13 nationalities in one classroom and people identified themselves with certain aspects like the uh, religion, background, and so on. So they build groups and they bully each other. Now she wanted to, my teacher, she wanted to talk to the students and she wanted to educate them on how to actually use the social media instead of so they can use social media in, uh, in their favor instead of hating each other, but she couldn't communicate this idea because, again, of the, the gap between the generations. And she asked me to help her with that. So I was invited to hold a couple of lectures there, and the results uh, were amazing. I, would, I was talking, talking about the social dynamics and also the virtual dynamics, which has never been mentioned to that point. 
so I go to the classroom, I talk to the virtual I talk about the virtual dynamics, and the students look at me like, oh, it's the first time that has anyone ever mentioned that thing. And they never, never, nobody ever sat them down and made them think about the actions that they are doing online. So the teachers are the architects, they are the engineers of the mindset of the youth, but yet they cannot help. And the youth is asking for help, for help but they're helpless. The thing is that, um, are we going to create the generation who will hate everyone online, or are we going to create the generation who will fight against hatred online? And in that manner, I was uh, holding these lectures for two years now, and uh, every semester, one or once or twice in multiple classrooms. And right now, the results are basically, instead of hating each other based on different uh, aspects, they, are, uh, they have built study groups, they have built uh, a community where they help each other and support each other. Now, let me just ask a question for the people here in the room. How many of you do actually have TikTok installed on your mobile phones and are actively using it? One. Two, three, four, five. That's about like 5% of everyone here. So you see the generational gap. So the thing is that, let me, let me tell you a story. Imagine a pink elephant with some feathers flying around the room. What I just said makes no sense. But that phenomenon is called a meme. I managed to get your attention with it. Memes are supposed to be funny. It, it should bring joy, but it can also bring despair. It can be weaponized and used against a certain individual or a certain group to discriminate them. And cyberbullying is a real thing and it's happening amongst the youth all the time. That's the mental pressure that is put on the youth on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, with that said, I want to communicate one thing, that the teachers, I mean, of course, you, it's, it's important to educate the youth, but I don't think that the teachers can do that. I mean, you guys have the mindset of dinosaurs. I mean, it's just, <laughs> the, the generation gap is so big, and <clears throat> even though, uh, the thing is, don't take it personal, but it's like, the, the, the tables have turned. It's that uh, the youth is now the expert and, and now they know more about the digitalization era and they're living through it live. Regarding uh, the question again, the hate speech, so, you know, all these, Things that also bring joy, they can also be used as a weapon to discriminate people. So my point is just, are we actually going to build the generation who's going to fight hatred or are we going to just let them wander around in the chaos? And also the questions, I mean... I, I will, thank you, I will keep going on that, yeah. the, the next questions. Let me just take V, but I, I told my team we should have had a session about memes. You see that the two of them already <laughs> mentioned this, but you didn't believe me. So uh, V, uh, yesterday, I don't know if you were able to follow because it was too early here and, and for you, of course, uh, in the US coast, but we had an influencer also opening this event and he said that we should engage more influencers in this discussion. As uh, Charlotte and Ashton was saying, we should engage more young people. Um, so I, I'm glad to have you with us. Uh, you are one of those influencers. Uh, mm -hmm. But how are you taking the pulse of your, of your peers on this? Uh, I'm sure that a lot of young people interact with your program, but you also interact with other influencers. So w what is your take on, on this very hot potato we are holding here? Thank you for the question. So 
what I want to say first is the youth are more compassionate, emotionally intelligent, well-read than any other generation before. And I think based on that alone, we need to trust them. We need you to trust us. Um, they've grown up on the internet, as mentioned, and in many ways have lived the most globally. And I think that their voice, of course, needs to be included and in many ways prioritized as we continue to craft what the internet space is going to look like. Now, when we're talking about regulation and the motivations of regulations, I think we have to question, is this to stifle or to protect? Because often we see authority say things like, we have to protect the children, we have to protect the youth, and constantly bring up the worst parts of the internet and the worst parts of its effect on mental health. It's a tricky argument, because of course, everyone agrees that we must protect the vulnerable, but often protect the children is used as a high sense of urgency reason to regulate. When in fact they're trying to like police growth and exposure to viewpoints and truths that may be out of line with their parents or politicians views. So I argue that access to community, access to conversation, to ideas, special interest groups that they find on the internet is protecting children from things like ignorance, loneliness, self doubt. Access to the internet allows them education. And if we were to look at the ways that, say, prior generations were educated and the things their parents did for them, every good parent bought that whole set of encyclopedias, right? The internet can be used for that same purpose. It's a wonderful tool that helps create educational equity and community where in-person resources have failed. Thank you, but and 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 you get these kind of concerns of the of your audience. I mean, the, the, are they how they are interacting with you on on these on these kind of two sides of the coin we have here? I'm, of course, I'm being simplistic. You just mentioned and these fantastic opportunities with the internet, but there are also serious concerns about that. We saw uh, the, the concerns about uh, particular problems like, uh, I don't know, bulimia, for instance, and how young children, mm -hmm. young women are, are interacting with this kind of contact in the online universe. So how you interact with your public on the, when they are asking you these kind of questions? So I tend to show up and set expectations for my audience in a way that shows them that I trust them. And so I don't have as many issues with bullying in my comments and my platforms as maybe other online journalists do or outlets do. Um, and I think that as much as we tend to prioritize the idea that the internet is causing eating disorders, if it wasn't the internet, it was magazines before that. If it wasn't magazines, it was clubs that people went to before that. I think if we're talking about an issue like an eating disorder or mental illness, we need to be attacking it from the root and not just blaming the discovery path, right? Because if we if we continue to try to villainize the internet as this like unique place where bad things happen, then we're ignoring that these things are happening in society all the time and we're not actually gonna get to the root of how we fix them. Because eliminating, let's say the internet or people under 16's access to the internet because it could give them a negative self image, they will find that negative self image in the real world if their basic needs aren't being met, if their mental health isn't being nurtured, um, if they're not being taught by society that they are valuable and important and cared for. So I think while it shows up on the internet, I, I do believe that we over-focus on the internet's negative impact on the youth and tend to discount the positive impact. Thank you. So, I mean, now for the three... <laughs> Thank you, V. And, and now for the three of you again, I mean, all these dinosaurs here, to use Hashem's expression, uh, are concerned with this story on, well, we have different players that are relevant for this discussion, uh, the platforms, the governments, the regulators, the civil society, and so on. And we are trying to find here on, I mean, we agree that there is a common issue. Uh, there are, we need to, uh, keep fostering the huge opportunities internet offers, as, as V was describing. We need to mitigate some risks and, and solve some of these problems. The three of you have some, some views on that, on, on how we address some of these discussions? Uh, yes, and I'd like to add to something V said really quickly um, regarding um, trust when it comes to government talking about protection and, and, and regulators talking about protection, but also big companies talking about protection. Um, it's really difficult for us to trust big companies and governments because we never know are they talking about protection to protect us or are they talking about protection to protect themselves and it's something mm -hmm. that makes us very unsure and not trust the th things that we are being told 
Um, and regarding uh, solving the issue, I think um, education on digital platforms and how to regulate it needs to be part of a mandatory curriculum at schools. Uh, we grew up in a digital world, but we, do, we know nothing about regulations and policies and all of that. I Literally, I have no clue. Um, and schools, especially in Austria, are so behind on keeping up with educating their students on those topics such as digitalization, which is actually, it, that topic will be needed for our future careers and for our lives as citizens. And if they don't start educating young people now, they will keep falling behind and taking away not only a lot of chances and opportunities for the students, but also their safety on digital platforms, I believe. Um, so regulations and policies on digital platforms need to become more public to the youth in order to create an internet for trust. Uh, feel very free to welcome our session tomorrow on Friday, um, and I really want to challenge you to take the use, views and ideas more into account when it comes to regulating digital platforms. Thank you. Question, your take on this? So, um, regarding the regulation, I personally, I am working on a project right now, I'm building a social media app, and it's a social media app based on neighborhoods as statistics show that the Gen Z is losing touch with the real neighbors and everything is getting digital. We even have digital neighborhoods right now. I'm building this app to bring back the uh, real dynamic and to strengthen the communities within the neighborhoods. Now, also the uh, Content regulation thing is also a big thing. Uh, it's a big aspect of such a platform that I'm building right now. And I've attended a couple of confer conferences uh, in the last couple of days, and I realized AI, using AI as a content moderator is being discussed all the time, but we all know that AI is not really perfect. AI does let a couple of posts slide through, even though those posts would be pretty obvious for a human being to uh, decide just a split second uh, this post, it needs to be off the platform. Now, you can use the AI, but taking the only AI approach is wrong. You can, I would suggest using AI and, and the real employees to complement their skills during the work sessions. Thank you so much. V, uh, you know that these days in the U.S. there is this kind of discussions as well. And the Supreme Court is deciding on an important case regarding this. So what are you listening there on, on that side of the, the Atlantic about these kind of discussions? Yeah, so right now in our Supreme Court, there's a case called Gonzalez versus Google. And the, the, it has roots in the ISIS 2015 Paris attacks. Um, in the aftermath of that tragedy, a family who lost their child has now sued Google, claiming that Google is liable for damages because they aided and abetted the terrorists. Um, how did they do that? Because Google, which or YouTube, which Google owns, in, in this particular family's opinion, failed to remove ISIS recruitment videos that allegedly then recommended those videos to these terrorists and radicalized them that ultimately led to the death of their child. Now, we have... Um, a thing here called Section 230 from the 1996 Communications and Decency Act, which generally provides immunity for website platforms with respect to third-party content. Um, and this shield breaks the traditional rules of civil liability. Uh, so it's very different what you say on the internet versus what you publish in a magazine or say on television. There's no real accountability for the platform to the content that they platform. And so what the, what's interesting about this case is it's, it's widely you know, settled law and decided that you cannot sue based on a section 230 violation. You can't sue Google, YouTube, TikTok, anybody for what a user has uh, posted. But what they're trying to sue for is the algorithm. And they're saying that the platforms are responsible for their algorithms and what, um, what information is being prioritized because then there's this matter of choice, there's this matter of decision and, and thereby this matter of responsibility. And so that is something that we're not going to get a decision from the Supreme Court until the summer. It does look like the Supreme Court is going to continue to side with Section 230 and not allow there to be accountability um, for on these platforms for what their users post. Um, but something that I want to say outside of that is I want us to kind of take a look at the way 
we say who should be trusted, right? And what they should be trusted with. And oftentimes we tend to pick a guru. So when we're talking about the youth, maybe we're thinking of like Greta Thunberg and we've given this particular young person endless trust in platform, right? We've said like, this is the person when something environmentally happens, we're going to go to her. She's going to be our popular um, voice. And I would argue that on the internet, in the digital space, in addition to Greta, are thousands, if not millions of other young people who are doing smaller levels of work locally, as, as said, in their neighborhoods that are just as important, that need to be prioritized just as much. Um, I think of the Native American water protectors, the women of Iran who were using digital platforms to uh, get the word out about the protests in Iran. If we start to regulate the youth because we don't trust them or because we're only going to pick one guru per topic that's going to be the one that gets to be the voice, I think we're going to put ourselves in a dangerous place because the wealth gap between what education and access to education wealthy people will have versus average people will have will continue to widen if we continue to try to regulate how young people are allowed to use the internet. Thanks a lot. To the three of you, Charlotte, Archie, and Hamdi, this dinosaur here learned a lot. Uh, and I'm absolutely impressed for your description of what's happening in these different contexts. So a strong round of applause. Um, we are going to break for lunch now, but please be back here at 2.30, and then we are going to discuss the engineering problems of this confusion. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bon appétit. Thank you.